Excuse me. My name is Marshall Kobusen, and I'm Professor of Auditory Culture and Music Philosophy at the Academy of Creative and Performing Arts at Leiden University. I will briefly introduce this ARC session, a monthly event organized by the Academy of Creative and Performing Arts around artistic research. Tonight we are, without audience, in Studio Lowe's in The Hague. The session tonight is entitled Sounding Sonic Materialism. And in this introduction, I will tell in a few words how I came to this title. Actually, it's a three-stage rocket to be explained from right materialism to left sound and sounding. Roughly at the new beginning of the new millennium, a new interdisciplinary, theoretical and politically committed field of inquiry emerged called new materialism. The term materialism can pertain to corporeal life as well as to inorganic objects, technologies and non-human organisms and processes. What is new is that matter is considered as an active force. In other words, it is not sculpted by, but also co-productive in conditioning and enabling social worlds, human life, discourses, and experiences. So, matter is explored beyond its ideological articulations and discursive inscriptions. Better yet, New materialism strives for a constant interaction between matter and meaning. The move to sonic materialism came first from Christoph Cox and Salome Vögelin, both prominent thinkers in the world of sound studies and sound art. Both Christoph and Salome proposed to rethink the concept of matter through sound. Usually matter is considered as solid matter, but sounds are not bodies, no punctual or static objects. They are temporal, durational flaws. They thus accord with an empirical account of events and becomings as processes and alterations. In other words, 
new materialism, not so much resounds in sound art and sound studies. Sound as vibration, as flux, as event, is the harbinger of new materialism. Sonic materialism not only, or maybe not even primarily, is about sense or meaning, about thinking and res reflection, but also, maybe primarily, about sensibility. And this brings me to sounding sonic materialism. What would it mean to think sonically, rather than merely to think about sound? How can sound alter or inflect new materialism? How can it inflect or alter the thinking that takes place in sonic materialism? What concepts and forms are thought of thought can be generated by sound itself? In short, tonight's event is meant to make new materialism and sonic materialism audible, to let it sound to let you experience how both new materialism and sonic materialism are always already taking place in and through music. I would like to end this introduction by a brief quote from Donna Haraway. It matters what matters we use to think other matters with. It matters what stories we tell to tell other stories with. It matters what knots, not knots. What thoughts think thoughts. What descriptions describe descriptions. What ties tie ties. It matters what stories make worlds and what worlds make stories. End of quote. It matters what matters we use. Exploring new materialism or sonic materialism through sounds, through art, through artistic research might lead to new insights, experiences, engagement with matter and meaning, with sounds and reflections. It matters what thoughts think thoughts. It matters because thoughts thought through sounds differ from thoughts thought through, for example, philosophical texts. It matters because sonic stories make different worlds. They do not replace visual or other worlds, but offer new ones. Or they offer new experiences, new knots, new ties of already existing worlds. I hope you will enjoy the next three performances by Gabriel Payouk, Richard Barrett, and Kevin Fairburn, respectively, in their own specific ways, in their own thinking, playing, they explore the fascinating world of sounding sonic materialism. Hello, good evening. Thanks, Marcel. So my name is Gabriel Payuk. I'm a composer and sound artist. Uh, originally, we were going to have this session live here at Studio Laws, and I was going to present a work in progress. It was a sound installation of a, of a project I've been developing for a while called Oscillacion or Oscillation. Um, I'm not presenting this today because essentially, and that's part of the, the core of what I want to speak a little bit for, now in, in the next minutes, um, the focus I'm interested in investigating and developing my work has actually to do with probably in the context of what we are talking today, the material aspects of listening. And that was basically 
to bring up the conditions that happen in the situated location of listening cannot be reproduced through the circuit of the stereo system we are using now through the online platform. So that's why I, I'm not be, being able to present that, but I will present two small documents of earlier works. So we'll start with that. First, we're gonna see a small presentation of an installation from some years ago called Focus, done in November Music Festival in 2017. Uh, and then we will see an excerpt of a piece called The Construction of an Imaginary Acoustic Space, played by the New European Ensemble, uh, which is a piece for ensemble and uh, soundtrack on six loudspeakers and tape machines. So we start with that and I will speak after that.
fundamental measure through which we through which the world should be accounted for oversimplifying some of the main claims of some of the most prominent proposals of these philosophies we can refer to philosopher Karen Barat as she denounces the excessive role attributed to language and the primacy of a knowledge exclusively articulated around human agency to expand the role, the, 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 the figure of agency to matter in a more broad perspective. Graham Harriman, for example, who's the proponent of a, a particular philosophical perspective called object-oriented ontology, further develops a criticism of what he labels following Genti Meyasu, the tenets of correlationism, aiming to dismantle further any priority that the modes of access of humans may have in dealing with objects and dealing with what he would refer as to somehow the incommensurability of objects. Along this path, he questions the inherited models that are used to conceive how communication is thought through the models of human access and, and try to get into this other perspective in which the, as I said, the incommensurability of object is put in, in the first place. The way this question of an anthropocentric uh, starting point of paradigm relates to my research is, as I said a bit uh, just a few minutes ago, through an account of the material conditions, the material nature of how listening takes place. My question for a while has been how to account how different ways in which listening happening listen, listening happens and not only dependent on the will of the listener, uh, which is how we are usually are, are used to think of, of listening as something which is, is shaped by the will of a particular listener, but how certain configurations actually make happen, mold the way in which listening takes place. An important reference in my research is the work of philosopher Gilbert Simondon. Simondon never assumed himself as a materialist. It might be probably wrong to, to term him as, as, uh, as, a, as a rigorous materialist, but his position could somehow be understood, thinking along these lines, as that of a non-substantialist materialism. This is an interesting distinction, which is relevant for two reasons. Not only because it points towards one of Simondon's main contentions, the criticism of what he names as the hylomorphic model in which individuation has been conceived since Aristotle. So basically a criticism that he poses to the idea that individuation happens through the application of a form to a matter. So the idea that there is something like a raw matter that, that is molded through form. This is an essential uh, aspect of, of Simondon's criticism. But also to the way, in a way, this materialist perspective appears in Simon Don as an operational account of how the real occurs. And the way this is located, or this brings up a fundamental thread that I am engaged with, is basically that this is the way that Simon Don tackles the sensorial. This is a key to the kind of questions that I want to address, and I probably were post in the works that I just showed. Let me read you a, a brief quote from, from Simon Don from his from a course on perception. He says, it would be wrong to conceive perception as an isolated function. In fact, although perception could be conceived as disinterest contemplation and independent from any action, this is not its primary status. Perception is to be linked to the vital dialectic of the organism, primarily it is to be understood as a function inherent in the complex system which goes from motivation to action through the mediation of an information guide. Perception is grounded on the possibility to conceive of an organism as a modulator. A modulator is a system which synthesizes energy and information. So what is essential here is the first sentence of this quote when we tend to conceive, conceive as perception as associated with this passive reception. But Simon Don is very concerned with placing perception as an unfolding actually of the even individuation of an organism that always happen within a certain configuration, within a certain set of actions that the organism is engaged in. <clears throat> We won't go so much deeper into that, but Simon Don discloses then the perceptual act as part of a metastable mechanism, which is also inherently technical. 
let me read another quote. Uh, I hope it's not too long, but to, to expand a little bit on, on Simon Don's position. This is, this is actually a quote from Andrea Bardin, a scholar on Simon Don. He says, the symbolic field is, according to him, a determinate regime of production of relations and of processes of information exchange, inconceivable through categories exclusively biological or cultural. The Simon Don explains the emergence of the symbolic function, starting from the relations between organisms and their mixed milieus made of nature, other organisms and symbols derived from the subsequent sedimentation of such relations. This is an approach according to which sense is neither produced by organism nor by homo sapiens, but emerges from the relation of communication through which groups of organisms and the organism itself at different levels and through different milieus are structured. This is how Simon Don became fundamental to, to my investigation to, to give a core to the question of how listening cannot be separated from a context in which it unfolds. What we saw probably in the, in the, in the two trailers that we looked at at the beginning are these works in which my intention is to work on the configuration of listening in which the, the listener gets engaged with. For example, what happens in focus the, the, the first work that you saw, the sound installation, is that perceptual distinction of a sound is problematized because the engagement of the listener with what is heard is informed by the conditions in which the technical setup produces a spatiality which is inherent to each of the device that you saw. You probably saw in the trailer that the listener is invited to traverse different constellations of loudspeakers and different material combinations of types of loudspeakers and, 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 and configurations across the space. What happens is that as this piece uses field recordings which are originated in particular spaces, the aim is not to actually convey a reenaction of that particular space that has been recorded, but actually to expose how there is a particular spatiality which is inherent to that device uh, to the configuration, to the constellation of loudspeakers that the listener is engaging with. Thus the emphasis is not on the pr production of a sonorous location, but in exposing how the spatial awareness is proper of that mechanism. The most relevant aspect of the piece are the thresholds in which a sonorous impression is either grasped as a spatial awareness or as the almost tactile imprint of the loudspeaker, because it is perceived as a physical experience. These thresholds or change in the engagement of the listener is a combination of the way the listener takes part in this configuration to stabilize it and what I will call an acoustic image and the material traces of interference of wave patterns. So I don't have much more time, um, but probably s summing up a little bit, when, when Marcel asked me to, to participate in this session and, and locate my work within the context of this speculation and talk about sonic materialism, um, as I said at the beginning, my emphasis was to try to bring up how my work deals with how listening unfolds in the material context. And let's say one question that is, I think, fundamental in the work that I try to do is let's say, tackle how the sound of a stone is no less material than the sound of a C minor chord. And what, did that, what does that mean? Because basically this refers to some of the inherited assumptions that we take usually when we talk or when we refer to a materialism when we associate it with sound. We tend to think that there is something that can be conveyed which brings up this material characteristics, but basically what I'm trying to produce in these works in which what is problematized is the engagement of the listener, this perceptual situation which, as Simon Don develops, cannot be detached from the context, from the circuit in which it happens, is that what is accounted as a material event is exactly this configuration, this feedback process, this engagement of the listener in which 
what can be accounted is how this material event is, is unfolding. And that is a little bit the area where, as I said at the beginning, I became interested in exploring how listening occurs in a plural way, so in different ways, not just because of the will of the listener, but because of how this configuration unfolds. I think I'm going to stop here. It would be ideal to have a Q&A, but I guess we will leave that for, for another moment. And uh, after me, you will hear the presentation of Richard Barrett. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Richard Barrett. Um, I'm a composer and performer, and I'm also a um, professor of creative music research at the Academy of Creative and Performing Arts at Leiden University. Um, today, after I've finished talking, I'm going to play a composition which was made for my own computer instrument, which you can see in front of me here. Um, the title of this composition is Hylozoan which is um, a neologism, um, taking its name from hylozoism, the idea that the basic substance of matter is in some sense alive. So a hylozoan, therefore, denotes a living being which is composed of this basic substance. In this case, a living being made out of sound substance. To an important degree, the sound forms assembled for a composition involving this instrument of mine constitute material in the sense of being the instrument rather than only coming into being at the connecting point between player and physical interface. This instrument and its music thus bring the concept of sonic materialism into a particular kind of focus which I'll explore in the presentation, although the main focus of my contribution to the discussion should be thought of as being located within the performance that I'll be presenting. Any performing musician will know that developing a relationship with their instrument over years of practice will have the effect of making that instrument an extension of both their body and their mind. Since a computer might also be imagined to have a mind of its own, in the sense of being able to make autonomous decisions, even if it obviously lacks the desire that motivates decisions made by human minds, one might expect the mind extension aspect to have a somewhat different quality than in the case of a traditional instrument. Added to this is the fact that one's physical relationship to a computer instrument isn't provided in advance by something analogous to the mouthpiece of a trombone but has to be devised by the player. In this way, working with a computer-based instrument erases the distinctions to a greater or lesser extent between instrument building, composition, and performance. Activities which with traditional instruments have been quite distinct from one another and indeed have usually been carried out by different people. My own preference in thinking about all those issues is to gather them all under the single heading of musical creation or composition, which includes within itself such methods as improvisation or notation on the one hand, and the design of programs and interfaces on the other. Conceiving and designing a computer instrument and its physical interface is a compositional act. This means that for me at least, it should involve a high degree of openness so as to allow for the evolution of one's musical thinking and practice over an extended period of time. I've been playing the same instrument for 23 years or so, 
even though both software and hardware have developed quite considerably over that period. The development, such as it is, of my performative skills on this instrument has been a continuous process rather than having had to start again each time a new setup is devised. My conception of the instrument has always focused firmly on what I think of as an intimate physical relationship with sound. My priority has always been that the technology should enable the maximum degree of freedom in putting the sound material into my hands and interacting with it in real time, shaping it, and at the same time being shaped by it. One of the several ways in which I think digital instruments like this are particularly suited to an improvisatory approach to creating music involves looking at the quasi-collaborative aspect of working with an instrument which has, as I said, a mind of its own. Of course, this might be viewed as a difference in degree rather than in kind between a computer and an acoustic instrument, since an acoustic instrument will also have its idiosyncrasies, its instabilities, and its embodiment of perhaps centuries of musical thinking and practice. But with the computer, these idiosyncrasies and instabilities have been purposely expanded and enhanced with some more or less controllable constellation of random, deterministic, and statistical variables taking on a critical mass to the point where it's sometimes more productive to think of it as a personality rather than just a tool. Various aspects of the instrument might be subject to more or less controllable randomization, which might function on the one hand to create complexly changing textures whose overall evolution might be under performative control without every detail having to be put there by hand, although that is also possible. Or on the other hand, to create a degree of unpredictability to which I can then respond spontaneously in the process, perhaps discovering new musical pathways in each performance. The sound materials of this composition mostly derive from a digital emulation of an analog synthesizer. And its structure is based on a progression through these materials whose rate and direction and focus are constantly evolving in real time through my own actions and reactions as a performer. Although in fact I would say that the actions are indistinguishable from the reactions. The details of my pre-compositional scheme influence the course of events without determining them. The last time I played it was for a recording session last year, during a period when I was practicing and performing quite a lot, although for virtual audiences, um, but hadn't performed this particular piece for many months. And um, I sat down, emptied my mind as far as I could, pressed record, and started to play. The result was, to my mind, much more successful than the ones I'd produced in conventional concerts with, with much more preparation. And paradoxically then, the best way to perform this composition was to forget about it as far as possible, to exclude it from conscious thought. How much, I wonder, does this process have in common with improvisational performance in a more general sense? Probably a great deal. The use of a computer as improvising instrument then has another potential value, to expose and analyze and therefore perhaps better to understand the mysterious processes that go into musical improvisation, how it generates the life and the death of sound forms which themselves seem to have minds of their own. What does this have to do with sonic materialism? Well, I think the way I've described my conception of and my interaction with a computer-based instrument makes it clear that I'm working with an imaginative materialization of the resources at my disposal. My physical relationship with the hardware in front of me is only part of the story the path that, like my pre-composed structure, is forgotten during performance. The real relationship is happening in the sonic space that this hardware enables me to enter, and this depends upon envisioning the instrument, the composition, the performance as a multidimensional entity, which is at the same time an extension of the mind and body of the performer and something external to it, at the same time something that might be fluently pliable or awkwardly recalcitrant, or both. When I speak, like many composers do, of course, of musical materials, I mean this in quite a literal way. While the sense of the materiality of sound has been more often associated with what has come to be called sound art rather than with musical composition as such, I would argue that a compositional structure, just like any other aspect of sound, 
is something that takes on the same degree of materiality as the vibrations and resonances of which, from a different viewpoint, it would be said to exist, to consist. A composition might be conceived or experienced as a chain of sonic events or as a single complex one or as something intermediate. But most importantly, those seemingly distinct conceptions and experiences can coexist in the listener's mind and in the same time and space.
I will speak uh, very briefly, just to um, contextualize what is going to come next. Um, and then there will be some music. Um, listening is a critical part of the sonic materialisms that so far exist. Taking listening as the sense of an emergent embedding in a broader ecosystem of bodies, materials, and agency. These bodies commingle and collide. They congeal in a specific situation and collaboratively enact a sounding moment. Listening in sonic materialism means identifying the ways in which seemingly discrete bodies are, in fact, not at all discrete, but are rather deeply entangled in one another. Much of sonic materialism focuses on the dispersion of these energies through a massed potential of sound waves that are kinetically released, vibrating in physical media, giving life to both hylozoans and the implicated bodies that resonate alongside them. In much of my recent work, though, I have attempted to examine the way that sound is equally entangled with vast networks of bodies and agency that precede the sounding moment itself, stretching backwards in time and space in messy, disjointed patterns. As Anna Livnop Singh notes in describing polyphonic ecologies, how an ecosystem responds and evolves in the face of disturbance is determined by a broad scaffolding of interbody material complicity, a scaffolding that bridges many scales of space and time. This is to say, the seeds that open up after a forest fire were not prepared in that moment alone. For several years, I've been constructing instruments and performances and installations that seek to investigate this multi-scalar scaffolding of bodies that produce sound and music. They seek to expose the discontinuous streams of energy and complicity that collide in the bodies that produce and listen to a particular sounding moment. Sound leaves marks on bodies, even as bodies mark the world with sound. Listening with and enacting sound teach us how sound leaves these marks on our own bodies, but I also want to examine the way that bodies leave marks on each other and on sound itself, how these bodies engage in polyphonic complicities of resonance and interference long before the sound waves that they produce ever begin to vibrate. As an instrument builder, I am highly aware how decisions made early in the craft process dictate which sound and performances that instrument will be predisposed to. I know what I need to do to make a trombone, but I also know everything that is done along the way to prevent it becoming something else. As Karen Barad writes of quantum materialization, quote, interactions effect what's real and what's possible as some things come to matter and others are excluded as possibilities are opened up and others are foreclosed, end quote. Crafting instruments occurs on a much larger and messier scale than the quantum phenomena Barad describes, but nonetheless, what we do to the brass or the wood or the strings very much infects what is real, what sounds are excluded, and what possibilities are generated at the expense of others. As such, I have sought to explore the bodies of brass instruments, discovering and exploring their foreclosed and excluded sonic materialism. These projects, I work primarily with the detritus of the instrument building process, which is to say, with so called waste materials. The machines that are used to produce these instruments mark them aggressively, turning flat metal into the tubes and bells that you see here. But not always. Sometimes those marks leave damage, things go wrong, and suddenly what would have been a trumpet or a trombone is just metal again, waste material, 
be melted down and formed into some other body. Instead, I have taken these leftovers and formed them into both new instruments and chimerical homages to older ones. Even as they may never be trumpets or trombones, their carefully formed brass still possesses many innate acoustic properties. This performance will seek to revive these waste materials and show how the disjointed process of instrument building helps to reveal the emergent forces by which the marks we leave on bodies can give life to other unexpected forms resonating and vibrating long after they were left for dead on a workshop floor. By performing these instruments, I hope to map the patterns of influence and interference that converge and diverge through their sonic agency. If sonic materialism is a collaborative and participatory phenomenon, then these instruments can help trace the nonlinear networks of sonic possibility that mark and are marked by our bodies.
Richard Barrett. Gabriel Payouk. My name is Marshall Cobbs. Thank you.